today, which is from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 8, verses 40 through 56. I want us to consider how when something happens, an event, in this case, healing, just like the healing Florence read to us about in the book of 1 Kings, people within that story experience that event in different ways, right? That's true for us today. You hear about something happening, and if you talk to one person, they have a different perspective than another person than another person. And so that's what we're doing this morning. We're going to look at this event in Luke chapter 8 from three perspectives, from the perspectives of the the crowd, those gathered, the perspective of those who received healing, and from the perspective of Jesus. Now, obviously I'll take a little bit of liberty here, I wasn't there, (laughs) but we will try to do our best as we dive into that scripture. So would you keep that in mind as we hear God's word from Luke chapter eight, verses 40 through 56. Now, when Jesus returned, and he had just cast out um, demons into a herd of swine, so he had performed this pretty remarkable act, when Jesus had returned, the crowd welcomed him, for they were all waiting for him. Just then, there came a man named Jairus, a leader of the synagogue. He fell at Jesus' feet and begged him to come to his house, For he had an only daughter, about 12 years old, who was dying. As he went, the crowds pressed on into him. Now there was a woman who had been suffering from hemorrhages for 12 years. And though she had spent all she had on physicians, no one could cure her. She came up behind him and touched the fringe of his clothes. And immediately her hemorrhage stopped. Then Jesus asked, who touched me? When all deny it, Peter denied it. Peter said, "Master, the crowds surround you and press in on you." But Jesus said, "Someone touched me, for I noticed that power had gone out from me." When the woman saw that she could not remain hidden, she came trembling, and falling down before him, she declared in the presence of all the people why she had touched him and how she had been immediately healed. He said to her, daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. When he was still speaking, someone came from the leader's house to say, your daughter is dead. Do not trouble the teacher any longer. When Jesus heard this, he replied, do not fear. Only believe and she will be saved. When he came to the house, he did not allow anyone to enter with him except Peter, John, and James and the child's father and mother. They were all weeping and wailing for her, but he said, do not weep, for she is not dead, but sleeping. And they laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and called out, child, get up. Her spirit returned, and she got up at once. Then he directed them to give her something to eat. Her parents were astounded but he ordered them to tell no one what had happened. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. A friend of mine wrote a piece of poetry about the hemorrhaging woman. And the refrain in the woman's voice is, or if I but touch the edge of your coat, shall I be made whole? This is from poet Daniel Roberts. If I but touch the edge of your coat, shall I be made whole? The hemorrhaging woman, her only identifying feature in this text at first is the fact that she's been bleeding for 12 years. Our modern culture has difficulty speaking of such things without shame. How much more shame would a first century woman in Hebrew culture feel. Her religion teaches her that she is unclean, unfit for community, unfit for touch. So pause for just a moment to consider how scandalized the pressing crowds were by this woman's very presence, let alone her audacious act of touching the clothes of a rabbi, Jesus. Jesus. 
So not only does this story of the bleeding woman sit in the middle of our text today, it's bookended by Jairus and his dying daughter. That story happens at the beginning and end of this text. Here sits in the middle the bleeding woman. I believe that this is also the theological center or focus of this section of scripture. All of the other details make sense because of what happens between Jesus and the woman. And let me tell you why here at the beginning of the sermon rather than at the end. Because I think this will set up what God is saying to us here in Luke 8. The rest of the passage makes sense in light of this encounter between Jesus and the bleeding woman because this encounter reveals Jesus' character and mission for us. This encounter tells us who Jesus is and why he matters so much. Before the woman touches Jesus, she has no name, just a label. She is the bleeding woman. After she touches Jesus, she's given a name. She's called daughter. She belongs, she's part of the family, before and after. Something transformative happens when people encounter Jesus Christ. And this transformation is absolutely not limited to the clean or the elite. Quite the opposite is true. Every single human being, every single image bearer of God can have a before and after with Christ. So that is the center of our text. With this main idea in mind, let's now look at these healing accounts from three different points of view. The crowds, those who are healed, and Jesus. So first, the crowds. Last summer, my family and I went to Disneyland, and it was so fun and so crowded and so hot, all of those things. It was just as wonderful and exhausting as you can imagine. And it's a good thing Disneyland is so darn fun because if it weren't, the crowds might deter you from ever going again. When I read about the crowds here in Luke's gospel, the ones pressing in, I visualize that crowded place. Not that first century Palestine is Disneyland, but get in your mind a crowded place, somewhere you've been before that is just shoulder to shoulder, people everywhere. Pressing in, pushing, trying to get to Jesus. It's just overwhelming. It's interesting, these crowds and their place in this scripture, because in verse 40, right after Jesus sends the demons away, the text says that the crowds welcome Jesus. Hey, we like you. Good job. Suggesting that they have hospitality and that they're excited about what Jesus is doing. But by the time Jairus approaches Jesus and Jesus is moving through the crowds, they have gone very quickly from welcoming to pressing in likely a matter of minutes. The crowds want Jesus, but they want him on their terms. Gosh, it's really great that you sent those demons away and the pigs, but don't, don't heal or touch bleeding people. And the word for press, that pressing in of the crowds, that word for press is the same word used in the parable of the sower for the thorns that choke the word of God. It's not a pleasant picture. It's a clamoring, controlling scene. But Jesus pays no mind. He rarely does. Jesus focuses on what's really at stake. More on that in a minute. So back to the crowds. They are not waiting in line for It's a Small World, but they are trying to get a piece of this Jesus guy who is causing waves in their community. From the perspective of the crowds, these two healings are a little bit bothersome. The first, with the woman, because it is downright scandalous. Jesus is breaking holiness codes right and left. The second, because everybody can see it's not worth Jesus' time. The girl is already dead. So that's the crowds. 
The second perspective is twofold. It is from the point of view of the healed, the woman and the child, and by connection, her father Jairus, who cries out on her behalf. And on the surface, these two people, the woman and the child, go about approaching Jesus in two entirely different ways. I think this is interesting. Jairus, a man of religious stature, begs Jesus to come and heal his daughter. A parent petitioning for the life of a child. Some have voiced this prayer, perhaps even in this room, and it's unimaginable. Jairus has, before the crowds, stopped and come to his knees to speak to the healer, the Christ. Any adult who has any child in their lives for whom they have influence or responsibility can understand Jairus' actions. He is pleading he has nothing left to lose. The woman, on the other hand, is so low in society and culture that she should actually be outside the walls and kept from any human touch. So Jairus is humiliating himself, but he has position. He has authority. He has respect. This woman should not even be there. She approaches Jesus in silence. She is not crying out. She is not begging, but she is de just as desperate. All she does is touch his garment. I wonder about this woman. Perhaps she is afraid that Jesus will call out a sin or be embarrassed by her bleeding. Perhaps the cries of her heart are just as loud as Jairus, but all she can do is reach out a hand. She has no voice. No one is listening to this woman. She is nothing. I envision each one of these people, Jairus and the woman, speaking the words of their holy scriptures from Psalm 119, which they would know. I am severely afflicted. Give me life, O Lord. Give me life. One loud, the voice of Jairus. One silent, the voice of the woman. One kneeling in worship. One reaching out for just a touch. Two cries, two healings. One scandalous, one pointless. Two healings, two resurrections. Now we get to Jesus. What is happening with Jesus in this story during all of this activity? He seems to ignore Jairus at first, which must have left Jairus terrified and frustrated. How many in this room have prayed in desperation to God and felt as though God simply walked away? I have. We know what it feels like. It's confusing and lonely. But Jesus continues on through the pressing crowds and feels that power leaving his body as the woman touches his cloak. That power leaving his body, the healing has cost Jesus something. It's sacrificial. It's personal. And then he gives her a new name, daughter. But Jesus doesn't forget Jairus' daughter. Upon hearing that she has died, he calls the family and crowds to faith, faith like the bleeding woman, and raises her from death. The text says the spirit of the daughter returned. Jesus is on a mission to bring new life. He remains clear in his purpose as he moves through the swarms of people he calls both the bleeding woman and the child by terms of endearment and belonging. Daughter and child would have both been heard in this context as tender and familial. Before no name, after a new name. Before death, after life. Jesus is the one who gives us a before and after. A little bit later in the service, we will come to the communion table together. And as you do so, 
a little bit later, I invite you to consider once more the crowds. They get a bad rap, don't they? I've given them a bad rap this morning. I wonder about their motives. I wonder if some of them were pressing in because they were crying out in desperation, just like Jairus and the woman. Give me life, Lord. I wonder if they were asking the question that my poet friend Daniel asks, shall I be made whole? What about me, Jesus? At this ta table, we get to see the wholeness that Christ offers in the form of a meal. This meal represents the eternal before and after that occurred on the cross and in the resurrection. We are, when we are invited to a meal, we know that we belong, right? If someone invites you, come over to my house for dinner, you feel that belonging. Just like the woman called daughter for perhaps the first time in decades, or maybe her entire life. When we are invited to this meal, we are at the center of Jesus' stories. We are a main character being invited into belonging and life. Reminded that when we cry out, give me life, Lord, Jesus hears because it is his mission to give us life. Come, touch Jesus' cloak and be made whole. Amen.